Itami, a 33-year-old otaku, always puts his hobby first, never taking his job seriously. On his way to an anime and manga convention, a giant gate appears in Ginza, Tokyo, when he walks into a pole and has visions of a fantasy world. A dragon flies out of the gate, followed by a legion of soldiers wearing what looks to be Roman armor, and they begin terrorizing the city. One of the soldiers lunges at a police officer. Itami jumps into action, tackling him to the ground and killing him with his own dagger. Despite being dressed in shorts and a t-shirt, he tries to get the police to evacuate the citizens. After a call to their higher-ups, they start following his orders. It turns out Itami is a JSDF, Japan's Special Defense Force reservist, and was promoted to first lieutenant for his heroic efforts in Ginza. He's not happy about his new position. After all, he missed the convention and now has way more responsibility than he ever wanted. He only took the job to pay for his hobby. The otaku life is the only life for him. The Prime Minister of Japan announces that they will be sending a JSDF unit through the gate with the full support of the US President. After three months of preparation and scouting, the new Prime Minister of Japan declares that the JSDF is now ready to deploy a special task force. Itami stands among the ranks, ready to find out what lies beyond the mysterious gate, which they dub the Special Region. In the Imperial Capital, the Senate petitions Emperor Molto on how to respond to the assault. Their army that met the JSDF at Almas Hill, where the gate is located, was completely obliterated. The Emperor sends messengers to rally neighboring states, but when they answer the call to arms, Duran, a commander, becomes suspicious when the Imperial forces are nowhere to be seen. They plan their attack for the following morning, but the Imperial army is still absent. Duran leads his troops to the battlefield only to find the aftermath of a bloodbath. Their first offensive results in approximately 10,000 deaths, their second, 40,000. They've never seen modern weaponry and are completely powerless against the JSDF. Duran plans to attack at night, but to no avail. The enemy signals with flares and guns down their forces. Shields are no match for bullets. The total death toll surpasses 100,000 and the Emperor's plans to neutralize the surrounding territory's armies is a success. They no longer have the power to overtake the Imperial capital. He orders the destruction of nearby towns and villages to cut off the food supply and create a dependency on the Empire. His daughter demands to know what he's going to do about the invaders, so he tells her to take her Order of the Rose, merely a princess playing knight in his eyes, to scout and assess the situation. The U.S. President decides to sit back and wait until Japan's operation fails. Itami is put in charge of the 3rd Recon Squad to survey the land and make first contact with the locals. Hopefully, peaceful relations are on the table. The team sees smoke in the distance. The source? An enormous flame dragon. There's one problem. Their intelligence tells them there should be a town in the middle of the blaze. Looking for survivors seems fruitless, since everything has been reduced to ash. Just when they decide to report back, Itami discovers someone unconscious at the bottom of a well. Repelling to the bottom, he retrieves the only survivor, an elf. They decide to take her with them back to Koda, the village they passed through earlier. When the townsfolk learn of the dragon attack, they immediately begin packing their belongings and abandon the village, including a young mage, Lele, and her teacher. When she sees the JSDF, she goes to investigate the strange people. She's saved by the JSDF just before a startled horse was about to trample her. A group of bandits plan to ambush the townspeople as they escape on the road, when a girl wielding a giant halberd appears. She mows them down, smiling the whole time, and introduces herself as Rory Mercury, an apostle of the dark god Emroy. The third recon team helps escort the refugees. Itami has to make some concessions to remain true to their peaceful mission, burning a cart with a broken axle blocking the way. Before they can continue their journey, they spot some crows on the horizon. It's Rory Mercury, the goth Lolita that Itami saw in his vision. The children refer to her as an oracle and rush to meet her. Taking a special interest in Itami, she joins them in their carriage, insisting on sitting on his lap. Before they can continue on their way, the flame dragon they saw raise the village appears, causing the elf to suddenly wake up. Their 50 caliber rounds are useless. The elf notices and motions to her eyes. Itami, confused at first, realizes she wants them to aim at its eyes. They ready an RPG and fire, but it's off its mark, until Rory springs into action, 
throwing her halberd at the ground, creating enough of an impact to move the dragon into the RPG's path. It explodes. Dismembering the dragon of its left arm, it retreats. The refugees thank the JSDF, but can't accept any more of their help and part ways, leaving a few stragglers with them, including the elf, Lele, Rory, and a few of the children. When asked what he'll do, Itami decides to bring them back to Alnus Hill as refugees, wanting to do the humane thing. As the team returns to the base, the elf, Tuka, awakens from a nightmare of her father sacrificing himself to save her. Pina and members of her Order of the Rose, Hamilton, Norma, and Grey, learn about the JSDF fending off the flame dragon from a local bartender. Itami is chewed out for bringing the refugees back to base without any communication, but he's quickly forgiven due to the amount of intel they can gather from the inhabitants, and he's tasked with their care. Lele picks up Japanese quicker than the others, understanding the importance of learning how to communicate. In China, the president believes that the special region would benefit more if the gate appeared in his country. Though they want to maintain diplomacy, he's ready to send in half of his forces if the opportunity arises. While in Japan, the prime minister is asked about the civilian casualties in the special region. Trying to garner public approval, he explains that it was a monster and the JSDF were not at fault. Lele, Rory, and Tuka marvel at the indoor baths and discuss the world beyond the gate. There are more countries than they thought, and Japan is merely one out of many. Pina speaks with Duran, who survived the battle, and learns that the massacre was due to the Emperor's orders, sending the other armies to die while the Empire's forces held back. She decides to visit Alnus Hill with her knights, stopping in Italica, a city on the way. Tuka still doesn't believe her father perished with the others, and asks for extra supplies and men's clothes. She's worried that they may have to find an alternate means of repaying the JSDF for their hospitality, though her worry quickly fades when Lele informs them of the numerous winged dragon corpses on the battlefield. Their scales are worth a pretty penny, and the JSDF has no use for them. Itami and his team travel to Italica to continue their mission and sell the scales. Though nervous at first, they reassure Tuka that she can trust the JSDF. They did fend off a dragon after all. The team spots a plume of smoke in the distance, billowing from the city of Italica. The city is under siege by survivors from the Allied army, fending off their attackers under the command of Princess Pina. After the battle, she dreams of her childhood and starting her own order of knights, despite the royals all treating it as a joke. But now, she finally has the chance to prove the Order of the Rose isn't useless after all. Suddenly, she's woken by a bucket of water to the face. The JSDF's third recon team has arrived at the gates. The princess gives them a tour of the mansion, while explaining that Italica's nobles died and left their only child in charge, so she took the reins as commander to defend the city. Itami is surprised he understands her, becoming more familiar with their language. They agree to help defend the city, and Pina tells the Third Recon to guard the severely damaged southern gates, mostly as bait, since there's only 12 of them. Rory wonders why Itami is allying himself with the Empire. He explains that he wants to protect the people of Italica and show the princess that they aren't enemies and that there are alternatives to war. The prospect of the upcoming battle excites Rory. She can finally go crazy on the enemy. But instead of attacking the south, the enemy breaks through the eastern gate, which Pina and her knights are struggling to defend. She hesitates to act, seeing the horrors of war for the first time. Itami waits impatiently for her to give the order and call for backup. What is she going to do? And why hasn't she done it yet? Itami calls for backup, but ground forces are too slow, so they send the airborne unit instead to aid the battle raging in Italica. The attackers kill the eastern commander, Norma, which bolsters the enemy troops as they continue to advance through the eastern gate. Princess Pina is still unsure of what to do. She keeps freezing up, unable to counter the attack. Rory can barely hold back and becomes euphoric. Lele explains that as an apostle of Emroy, the souls of fallen soldiers flow through her as a sort of aphrodisiac. She can't take it any longer and races towards the battle at the east gate with Itami and the third recon on her heels. The fourth combat unit's helicopters make their way to Italica to the tune of Wagner's Ride of the Valkyries, ready to light them up as the sun comes up. Rory arrives and instantly cuts down the largest bandit, shocking the enemy. As the fourth unit appears and starts picking off the bandits who attempt to flee, 
Those who stay are quickly dealt with by Rory and Kurabayashi. The fourth unit tells them to clear the area before using Gatling guns to mow down the remaining enemy forces. Pina fears that the JSDF will use their power to take advantage of their weakness, but during negotiations, they were taken off guard by their lack of demands. On their way back, the third recon unit is met by more of Pina's order, but they're not quite as friendly. Itami tells the rest of his unit to make a run for it while he's being taken prisoner. The third recon unit stakes out the town, waiting to rescue Itami. Pina chews out her knights, worried about the consequences of breaking the new treaty not even a day after it was signed. Gray suggests that they apologize, since they're no match for the JSDF. The team makes its way back into the city. Tuka uses her magic to knock out the guards. In the mansion, Itami wakes up surrounded by maids. They tell him the knights have been reprimanded, asking him to spare the countess. To his confusion, the third recon shows up at the back door, and the head maid tells them to treat them with hospitality. Pina commands her knights to make up for their mistake, even if it means offering their bodies. So Bozes shows up at the door, wearing a less than knightly nightgown. Upon entering, she sees everyone getting along and taking pictures. Angry and feeling degraded, she slaps Itami. He's called back to Alnus Hill to meet with the Japanese Senate, and Pina requests to travel with him to see what's on the other side of the gate, taking Bozes with her. Itami invites Tuka to speak with the Japanese government, along with Lele, acting as a translator. Rory overhears and demands to join them. Bozes asks Pina if they are willing to start a war over the broken treaty, but the princess quells any anxieties, reasoning that they wouldn't take them along if that were the case. They still don't understand why the Japanese seem so reasonable, treating their own people and even the refugees with such hospitality. They head out the next day, with Pina and Bozes in disguise, just in case. The special region's inhabitants are blown away by the immense progress that Japan has made over their own empire. They are now certain they stand no chance of winning a war against them. Itami is greeted by Komakado of the PSIA, Public Safety Intelligence Agency. He seems to have done his research as he goes over all of Itami's achievements. It looks like most of them he got out of sheer dumb luck. Apparently, he's a ranger and special forces, which floors Kuribayashi. She refuses to believe Itami could achieve such accolades. Before heading to the Senate, they need to buy some clothes to fit in, and they might as well have a well-balanced meal before testifying before an unbalanced diet. When they arrive, Pina and Bozes are held back, since they aren't even supposed to be there in the first place. Instead, they head to a secret meeting with foreign affairs. During the diet hearing, Itami is questioned by a senator who is bent on painting the JSDF in a bad light. She blames the third recon for the 150 civilian casualties during the flame dragon attack. He takes the stand and shrugs it off, simply stating, it was a dragon. They didn't have the firepower necessary to deal with such a threat. Another diet member corroborates his claims. After running tests, they concluded that the dragon's scales were comparable to tungsten. Basically, it was a giant flying tank that breathed fire. It would have been nothing short of a miracle if they had been able to save everyone. Moving on, she calls Lele to the stand to address the conditions in the JSDF refugee camp, but doesn't get the answers she was hoping for. Tuka can't even speak to the events of the attack, since she was mostly unconscious. The diet member spots Rory and thinks she must be in mourning due to her black attire. She's even wearing a veil. She berates Rory and accuses them of running away and not doing their job, since there were no JSDF casualties. Rory stands up for Itami and his team. Nobody has fought off a flame dragon and lived to tell the tale. They immediately took action to save as many civilian lives as possible, 450 to be exact. The diet member is offended by Rory's condescension, thinking she's merely a little girl, until Itami steps in, and they discover she's actually 961, Tuka is 165, and Lele is merely a 15-year-old human. Lele goes on to detail the different races of the special region. Elves can't die of old age, and Rory is actually a demigod who ascends to full godhood on her thousandth birthday. During the foreign affairs meeting, Pina and Bozes are extremely confused at how willing the Japanese are to compromise. Instead of holding their people for ransom, as a show of good faith, they hand the princess a roster of 6,000 prisoners they are currently holding and allow her to choose those she wishes to free. 
They use a bus as a decoy and all meet up in the subway, where Komakadu meets them a few stops later, believing they've successfully thwarted a suspected mole in their operation. However, Rory is uncomfortable being underground, and they get off a stop early. Komakado says to stick to the plan, just as it's announced that the tracks up ahead have been blocked. Streetside, someone tries to steal Rory's halberd, but can't carry it. Neither can Komakado, who's immediately sent to the hospital after trying to pick it up. With nowhere to go, since the hotel isn't safe, Itami decides to bring everyone to Risa's apartment. When asked who she is, nobody is prepared for his answer. Risa is his ex-wife. Itami and Tomita agree that his ex-wife's place isn't exactly the best safe house. Though they can't rule anyone out as the mole, being separated from Komakado is not ideal. Risa tells Tomita that she and Itami are still friends. Their divorce was mutual, so there's no animosity between them. The next morning, following his motto, hobbies before work, Itami decides it's time to have some fun. At least he shoehorns in a practical advantage as cover. Splitting up and sticking to public places should be the safest bet. Itami decides to head to the manga store. Pina and Bozes ask Tomita to take them to the library, and Risa suggests the rest of the women go shopping with her. Rory refuses, because she has no need for anything other than her formal attire, but her self-control isn't exactly under control. Tuka, Lele, and Rory get new outfits, so as not to stand out more than they already do. At the library, Pina and Bozes are blown away by how much literature it contains, but they have a different type of reading material in mind, some slice of life, light reading. Itami runs into Defense Minister Kano for the first time in 20 years. He was the first one to introduce Itami to manga. Now he needs the lieutenant to conduct secret operations, purchasing manga, since the minister can't be seen buying it himself. He orders Itami to stick with the original plan and take their guests to the rendezvous. The group reconvenes. Tuka bought a compound bow, Lele some books and a laptop, Rory got new clothes, and Pina and Bozes acquired some not-so-conventional art as Tomida had in mind. That night, they head to Hakone Mountain to stay at the Sankai Inn. The SFG has the resort under surveillance. While getting changed, Rory notices one of the operatives watching them, even at a distance of 450 meters. After the women are alone, in their respective hot springs, they wonder about Itami and Risa's marriage. They knew each other since childhood, and Itami had the means to support her while she pursued her career as a manga artist. A marriage of convenience, really. At least it was to Itami. As soon as he left for the special region, she filed for divorce. Meanwhile, the SGF is dealing with armed intruders targeting the special region's inhabitants, though they aren't quite sure why. After unmasking a few they took out, they seem to be American. The US president makes a call to Matoi, the Prime Minister of Japan. It's blackmail. They have enough dirt on the cabinet to stay their hand. The Prime Minister tells the Defense Minister to have his men stand down, but he doesn't agree to just hand over their guests. If he and the cabinet step down, the Americans lose their leverage. It's up to Kano now. Itami wakes up to find Rory drinking alone. Apparently, she can't sleep. There's a battle going on outside and she needs Itami to deal with it, having a hard time holding back. Itami also has a hard time holding back. She doesn't exactly look over 900. Saved by the bell, or ring, Itami's phone goes off, interrupting Rory's advances. The Americans get too close to the inn, and Rory decimates their black ops. They're not the only ones, though. Multiple special ops teams from different countries are caught in the crossfire. It's a massacre. Good thing Rory is invincible. There isn't much time. They need to get out of the inn and vacate the area. Itami gathers everyone and tells them to grab any usable weapons. They find a van, but instead of killing the lone agent, Lele knocks him out with magic. Everyone looks to Itami for what to do and why they can't stay and fight, but he has no idea. Pina wants to know whether she'll be used as a political prisoner. There are people who know Japan will benefit the most from the peace talks with the special region. The U.S. president is furious with Graham, the one in charge of the operation, about losing his team without capturing the targets. While stopped at a convenience store, Risa comes up with a plan. The guests from the special region will visit the Ginza Memorial, not only to pay their respects, but to have the public eye on them following the event. The following day, news breaks about the prime minister stepping down, and a reporter attempts to gather public opinion, 
when she spots a large crowd forming near the Ginza Memorial. Graham stakes out the area with another agent, but they aren't the only ones after them, and there are too many people to maintain any level of secrecy. Especially after Nanami, the reporter, notices her sister, Kurabayashi, who interrupts the broadcast to reveal that their team is being pursued, and has been for two days. Komakado appears and confronts Graham, who is apparently CIA. He calls the president, who is not happy after hearing that his entire team was arrested. The Chinese government tells their men to pull out, while the Russian president is impressed with how the Japanese dealt with the situation. Back in the special region, Pina is determined to bring an end to the war, after seeing just how advanced the Japanese civilization is compared to the Empire. She and Bozes plan to leave the next day, with a letter to expedite peaceful negotiations. A mysterious figure looks over the refugee settlement that has formed at Almas Hill over the past five months. While back at the capital, Pina gets ready to initiate peace talks between the Japanese ambassador and the Senate. The agreed-upon release of 15 prisoners from the Ginza incident includes the nephew of Lord Cicero, an essential figure who supports the majority of the Senate who wish for peace. Pina introduces him to the representative from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Koji Sugawara, who brought gifts from Japan, including a katana, which illustrates just how advanced they are as a nation compared to the Empire. Upon hearing that Japan is still at war with the Empire, the senator becomes irate until they reveal their bargaining chip, the release of his nephew. Itami, Rory, and a few of the squad members witness Tuka continue her incessant search for her dead father and discuss whether they should break the news to her or let her hold on to her last shred of hope. Itami, now alone with Rory, ruminates about her 960 years of life thinking it's made her a bit callous regarding these types of situations. She orders another round, but he warns her to slow down on the drinking. But she claims it's too late, while leaning in and asking what he's going to do about it, flustering him. The figure from before shows up at the tavern. It turns out she's a dark elf, and upon seeing Rory so close to Itami, she accuses him of taking advantage of a child. Rory plays along now that her night with Itami is ruined. He panics and makes a run for it. She introduces herself as Yao Ha Du Shi and turns to find that Rory has also vanished. She tells the tavern patrons that she's looking for the men in green, offering a reward for their help, a giant chunk of adamantium. But as soon as she mentions a flame dragon, nobody will take her up on the offer. That night, she has a nightmare about the dragon attacking her village in the Schwartz Woods. When she's woken up by two fighter jets, it only confirms her suspicions that the JSDF are the only ones capable of taking it on. Itami heads to the capital to aid in the peace talks. The Dark Elf Elders entrusted Yao to be their emissary, but there's one problem. When she finds the Green Men, none of them speak the local language. After beating up multiple thugs who offer to translate for her, she finds a store selling items from Japan. The clerk refuses to sell her the red book she was issued, used for translation. Two officers end up arresting her for stealing money from the thugs. They bring in Lele to translate, and she's released after the thugs admit to giving false reports. Since she seems desperate, Lele offers to ask the Japanese for help on her behalf. General Hazuma explains that the Schwartz Woods are in the Elbe Kingdom, outside of the Empire's domain. It would interrupt peace talks and spark a conflict. Lieutenant Yanagida notices Yao's devastation and mentions that Itami might be the only one crazy enough to help. Princess Pina and one of her knights, Hamilton, are waiting for Itami and the Japanese diplomat to deliver Japanese goods in the hopes of winning over more nobles to their cause. But that's not all. Itami is accosted by Pina, demanding to know if he brought the shipment of fine art, more of the manga they brought back from Japan the first time. A group of soldiers notice how upset Yao is disagreeing with the political reasons for refusing to help her. Like Yanagida, they mention that Itami is probably her best bet. As Yao makes her way to the co-op for the night, Itami makes his way back to Almas Hill. The princess's artwork isn't merely for leisure. It's being used to relay newspaper clippings detailing all of Itami's heroics since arriving in the special region. Despite looking like peace is on its way, the year of the Empire 687 is only half over. And unbeknownst to everyone, war is on its way. The JSDF soldiers prepare for an unofficial opportunity to influence the Empire senators, who are invited to a private party hosted by Pina. 
Meanwhile, Prince Zorzal mistreats Tool, a former queen of her own tribe who is now his slave. His aide Marcus interrupts and informs him about the JSDF's ongoing bribery of senators. In the capital, Pina engages with the senators, attempting to persuade them to cooperate with Japan. She impresses Sugawara, the Japanese ambassador, with her diplomatic skills. Itami and his men showcase their weaponry to the senators, who are astounded by the firepower and accuracy. The senators eagerly consider purchasing the munitions for their own armies, and after witnessing the devastating impact of mortars, they realize the futility of their efforts and despair over the overwhelming power imbalance. Some of Itami's men on lookout notice a group of individuals approaching on horseback. Suspecting them to be Zorzal's men, they don't want to be seen influencing the senators and quickly pack up and leave. Zorzal interrupts the party and questions Pina's motives. To divert his attention, she focuses on Japanese food, and he becomes obsessed with the exotic flavor of mustard. The third recon team settles in the capital city's red light district. Kodokawa, assisting as a nurse, receives a visit from a prostitute named Misery, who's excited about their birth control tech. She provides valuable information about the city's underground hierarchy, power structure, and gangs. Things are going reasonably well. She'd just like to see a little business from the JSDF men, who don't seem interested in their services. Kodokawa changes the subject, without mentioning the relatively thick report on her desk about special region STDs. Meanwhile, Tomita and Kodobayashi arrive at Pina's palace as her guests. In a tavern, Yao is looking for information about Itami's interest, claiming to want to do something for him, seeing as they kind of started off on the wrong foot. Rather than a thing, the somewhat intoxicated informant reveals that there are three people who are important to him. Later that night, Kodokawa receives an unexpected visit from the night shift. Some of them have heightened senses, capable of detecting natural disasters, and they warn of an imminent earthquake. The commanding officer takes this seriously. Back when he was deployed in Kobe City, he remembers seeing animals react well before anyone could have predicted an earthquake. To prepare, he orders an evacuation of the capital and sends word to Alnus and all teams within the capital. Panic and chaos ensue as the earthquake strikes. Residents seek shelter, while Itami and his team explain to Pina that earthquakes are common in Japan and respond with cool heads. Pina urges them to join her in meeting Emperor Molt to discuss what they've just experienced. Arriving at the palace, Pina introduces Itami, Sugawara, Shino, and Akira to her father, Emperor Molt. However, their meeting is interrupted by the arrival of Zorzal, who brought a Japanese prisoner of war, Noriko. Completely ignoring any formality associated with being a guest in the Emperor's throne room, Itami rushes in with a right hook to Zorzal's face, then incapacitates Noriko's handler. Kurubayashi cuts Noriko free and assures her that she's safe now. Despite the violence inflicted on their family member, in their palace, the Emperor and Pina are oddly silent. Zorzal orders the guards to attack but they are no match for just one JSDF soldier. When Zorzal refuses to answer a question about whether there are any other captives, Itami sets Kurubayashi loose on him. Oddly enough, Tuol intervenes, begging for mercy on Zorzal's behalf, and he finally confesses that others were sold into slavery. Sugawara then insists that the situation regarding Japanese captives in the Empire must be resolved before it's possible to move forward. The Emperor concedes how formidable the Japanese force is, but points out their weakness of being too attached to their people. Despite the lingering tension, the Emperor agrees to proceed with peace talks at Sugawara's convenience. The next day, unable to let the capture and abuse of their people go unanswered, the Japanese Air Force bombs the empty Senate building, terrifying the senators. Amid their internal conflicts, they debate whether to pursue peace or wage war against Japan. Zorzal recovers in his chamber, and Tuol tends to his injuries, while his older brother Diabo discusses their father's succession. Despite his incompetence and cruelty, Zorzal remains determined to become the emperor after their father steps down. Meanwhile, the JSDF airlifts Noriko to their base at Alnus Hill. She expresses a desire to contact her family but Itami tells her that communication lines aren't currently open. 
Itami discovered that Noriko's family was in Ginza the day of the attack. They are still missing and assumed dead. He decides revealing this should be handled delicately. In another part of Alma's Hill, Tuka wanders in denial, believing her father is still alive. Yanagida informs Itami of the Ministry of Defense's interest in the resources of the Elbe region, oil and diamonds to be specific. It's also where the dragon has recently settled down. Itami hesitates to accept the quote-unquote scouting mission, fully aware of the danger the dragon poses following their previous encounter. Like a good leader, he's concerned about the well-being of his soldiers, and his own for that matter. Yanagida then encourages him to address Tuka's trauma, which is directly linked to the dragon they're discussing. Itami struggles with Tuka, who sees him as her father. She's an emotional wreck after Yao confronted her with the truth. It was a manipulation to get Itami to agree to kill the dragon to save her people after the JSDF had refused to get involved officially. Elsewhere, Pina meets with her brother Diabo to discuss their father's decision to crown Zorzal as the next emperor. Both siblings are unsettled by the idea of Zorzal assuming the throne. Diabo declares his support for Pina, believing she's the empire's best hope. In the slave quarters, Tuol confides in her spy about her plan to manipulate and destroy the empire from within using Zorzal as her pawn. She admits to feeding him false information, goading him into waging war against Japan, fully aware of his inevitable failure. Itami chooses to play along with Tuka's delusion, temporarily assuming the role of her father. This arrangement leads to complications, however. Their unusual relationship attracts attention and Tuka is growing more attached and reliant on him. This is further complicated by the fact that Itami is being reassigned to the Imperial capital. When he informs Tuka of his temporary absence, she becomes upset, and Yao uses this opportunity to blame Itami for Tuka's suffering. Yanagida persistently discusses the dragon mission. He hopes Itami will make the right choice, and encourages him to inform him of any change. At the tavern, Rory and Lele tease him about his bizarre relationship with Tuka. In a random late-night chat with the King of Elbe, who's there recovering from injuries, Itami is further encouraged to follow his heart. All the little influences take effect just as the helicopter is lifting off to take him to the capital. Itami decides that slaying the flame dragon is the right thing to do, to help Tuka come to terms with her trauma as well as help out the Dark Elf tribe. He jumps out of the helicopter and visits Yanagida to discuss the details. Yanagida is initially pissed that he waited until the last possible second to change his mind, but sticks to his promise to handle the bureaucracy and help him prepare, providing transport and supplies. Itami requests a week's worth of rations for himself and Tuka, but that quickly changes to rations for five as Rory, Lele, and Yao insist on coming along. Tuol forges a letter with the official seal from the formal clan to Delilah, a warrior bunny, ordering the assassination of Noriko. The clan had taken her in and provided her with protection from Zorzal's men after her tribe was subjugated by the Empire. She's been doubling as a spy for them while working at a bar in the Alnus Hill settlement. In a meeting, JSDF higher-ups discuss Itami's cover story of resource exploration in the special region. They all know what's really going on and all agree that he's an idiot. But he's an honorable idiot. He's their idiot. They get organized to support his mission, continuing to refer to it as resource exploration, but prepare to go up against a dragon. Yanagida meets with the King of Elbe, who seeks assistance in communicating with the nobles of his kingdom. Yanagida feigns being disinclined, but negotiates mineral rights, tax exemption, and the JSDF's safe passage through his kingdom in exchange for cooperation. Delilah approaches Noriko with a knife, but hesitates when she mentions her resemblance to Tuol. Suddenly, Yanagida's on the scene and draws his gun, resulting in a confrontation where Delilah stabs him and then is shot multiple times. Both are carried off to receive medical care. While they recover, an investigation gets underway. The letter is found in Delilah's quarters, and its forgery confirmed. They still don't know who forged it, but surmise that Prince Zorzal has the most to gain from this kind of disruption. Hitoshi, a JSDF soldier working as a chef, is tasked with infiltrating Zorzal's ranks as a spy. In the capital, Zorzal visits the kitchen in search of Hitoshi, 
Intrigued by the delicious food he tasted at Pina's party, he invites him to visit the palace the following day for an important job. Meanwhile, the JSDF Air Force confronts the dragon with a pair of fighter jets. They take turns challenging the dragon's aggression and maneuverability, which leads to an attack of fiery breath damaging one of the jets and forcing them to retreat. They're chastised for their recklessness, but at least they've got more information about their enemy. Itami and his team travel in a Humvee guided by Yao. They arrive at her village, where hostile dark elves mistake them for intruders. Yao presents herself, but before there's any time to clarify the situation, the dragon appears, and suddenly, who they are takes a backseat to where are they pointing their weapons. Tuka is paralyzed. Whether by fear or denial or relived trauma is anyone's guess, though probably all three. Itami attempts to get her focused, urging her to face reality, seek revenge, and pull the trigger of the rocket launcher. She does, and misses, but the blast on the nearby mountainside is enough to drive the dragon away for now. Itami and his team meet with the Dark Elves to discuss their plan. He tries to train the tribe's warriors to use rocket launchers, the only weapon proven to have any effectiveness, and they head out on foot to a cave suspected to be the dragon's nest. Inside, they find bones and weapons left behind by failed dragon slayers. Itami instructs them to dig a hole in the middle of the nest, into which he wires up 160 pounds of C4 plastic explosive. That ought to do it. Outside, Rory sees the dragon on approach, but radio communication can't get through so much rock. Well, the plan was to not have to face the dragon at all, but just blow it up when it returned to the nest to chill. That's out. Now they have to survive a battle with the beast and blow it up. They manage to do some damage, but it isn't easy going. There are dark elf casualties and friendly fire injuries due to mishaps of inexperience with rocket launchers. To top that off, the detonation wiring for the explosives gets severed. No worries though, Tuka finally accepts her father's death, puts the blame squarely where it belongs, and reaps her vengeance by summoning a lightning attack on the dragon. This also detonates the C4, on top of which the dragon is conveniently located, putting an end to the fight. So they think. Outside, they find Rory on the ground and in rough shape. Another apostle, Giselle, appears, accompanied by two dragon hatchlings. She's there to retrieve Rory, who had apparently skipped town to avoid being wedded off in an arranged marriage. But she points out that Rory's conditions got nothing to do with her. Through magic, Rory had taken all the damage inflicted on Itami during the battle to assure his success. It was Giselle who had awakened the dragon in the first place, so she could rear its hatchlings as her minions. Upon hearing that the group, led by Itami, is responsible for the death of the parent dragon, she sicks its offspring on them. They didn't come prepared for a second dragon battle, never mind a tag team event, and do the only sensible thing to do. Run. Their escape is facilitated by the arrival of two fighter jets from the JSDF Air Force, which knock them out of the sky. And just for good measure, a convoy of heavy artillery fires on the downed beasts as well as a squadron of helicopters. Giselle, frightened by the firepower, flees. It's over, and the team gives in to their exhaustion. Although Tuka's pretty cheerful, and even though she's come to terms with the reality of her situation, she may just keep on calling Itami daddy just because. After their successful mission to slay the dragon, Itami faces a two-week suspension for going AWOL, but then the lieutenant general steps up and presents him with his commendations a medal, a promotion, an honorary noble title from the King of Elbe, and the Dark Elves show their appreciation by, uh, giving him Yao. Most importantly, his new assignment is to head up research on special region resources, which pretty much gives him free reign to wander about as he pleases, with all of his special region friends as guides. The two-week vacation passes quickly and uneventfully. Itami's team is now on the way to Rondel, where Lele plans to present her thesis on magic theory to become a master mage. Arriving in the city, they seek out Lele's older sister, Arpeggio. They're greeted by her sister's mentor, Mimosa, a scatterbrained old woman who keeps calling Lele, Lily. Arpeggio arrives, and it's clear that the sisters have a very competitive relationship. Meanwhile, in the imperial capital, the young noblewoman Sherry persistently pursues Sugawara. 
seeking his hand in marriage as part of her plan for peace and cooperation with Japan. Sugawada rebuffs her advances and attempts to avoid her, if for nothing other than propriety's sake. Zorzel grows increasingly furious with the ongoing peace talks, despite his efforts to sabotage them. Unbeknownst to him, Teul is hatching a plan with her spy to get things moving back in Zorzel's favor. A ceremony is held to celebrate the return of Imperial prisoners of war from Japan, and news of the dragon's demise is announced. Initially, credit is given to Rory, but it becomes evident that Itami and his team played a significant role in its defeat. The Emperor is proud to hear that one of the team, Lele, is one of his own citizens. He orders Pina to find her and bring her to the palace for commendation. He raises a toast to the Empire, everyone drinks, and all of a sudden, the Emperor collapses to the floor, poisoned by Tool and her devious little helper. Zorzel is quick to appreciate how he stands to benefit from this, while panic ensues among the rest, as the fate of the Emperor and the peace talks hangs in the balance. Zorzel seizes power as the acting Emperor and declares war on Japan. He imposes strict measures, including restricting the movement of Japanese ambassadors and putting the imperial capital under a curfew. False charges of accepting bribes from Japan lead to the arrest of members of the pro-peace faction. Zorzel and his loyal general's strategy is to attack the JSDF mercilessly, deceitfully, generally less than honorably, to overcome the firepower disparity. Pina attempts to reason with Zorzel, but is met with veiled threats. Determined, she seeks out Diabo, but discovers that he's on his way out of the city. He intends to unite the Empire's allies to persuade Zorzel to be more reasonable through a show of force. Meanwhile, in Rondel, Itami and his team hang out with Arpeggio and Mimosa. It turns out Rory and Mimosa are old friends, and 50 years prior, Rory had tasked her with trying to understand why there are so many different humanoid species in their world. She now has her answer and it all points back to the gate. It generally remains closed, but opens up at varying intervals of several hundred years or so. When it does, often some new humanoid species passes through, sometimes peacefully, other times not so much. Arpeggio frets over her lack of accomplishments compared to her sister, and decides on a whim that she'll just get married and start a family, and asks about Itami's eligibility. Lele pretty much reads out his CV, which is impressive. Yao speaks to his wealth, and Rory finishes up by pointing out that he's single. But then Lele chimes in to correct that last point. According to their customs, sharing a bed three times, which they have, signifies betrothal, making Itami and Lele engaged, technically. Before anyone's got time to process this, especially Itami, Arpeggio, outmaneuvered again by her little sister, has had it and challenges her to a duel. They're 13th, apparently, and Rory is all too happy to referee. Lele and Arpeggio are pretty evenly matched, and after an exchange of magical attacks, they're each weakened and without their protective barriers. Suddenly, a cloaked figure emerges from the shadows, aiming a crossbow point-blank at Lele's head. She's saved by Grey, an Imperial Knight who runs the assassin through with his sword. Grey reveals that Lele is targeted for assassination. They're not 100% sure by who, but they've got a good idea. He introduces Shandy, a Rose Knight sent with him by Pina to retrieve Lele. Itami suggests fleeing from Rondel rather than waiting for her demise. The team drives aimlessly in their Humvee, deliberately making unplanned turns and stops to confuse their pursuers. In the capital, Zorzel's henchmen, called Sweepers, conduct door-to-door -door searches, arresting individuals affiliated with the pro-peace movement or with any ties to Japan. The Japanese government decides to maintain a hands-off approach, refraining from interfering with the Empire's sovereignty and hoping that the peace faction will emerge victorious. Sherry falls victim to Zorzel's purge. Her parents are falsely accused of accepting bribes from Japan and face imminent arrest. They instruct Sherry to escape with Marquis Castle, telling her that they'll follow shortly. But then, in an act of defiance, her parents set their house ablaze, sacrificing their lives along with their would-be arresters. Sherry implores the Marquis to accompany her to Jade Palace, which serves as Japan's embassy under the protection of the Rose Knights. 
Upon arrival, they are halted by Pina's knights. They inform them that crossing into the palace grounds is prohibited since it falls under Japan's jurisdiction, and the government is adamant about staying out of the Empire's internal struggles. Sugawara learns of Sherry's presence and hears her calls for help. She pleads with him to let her see him and effectively save her. Sugawara faces a dilemma, torn between his duty and his sympathy for Sherry. He refuses to provide asylum, concerned about creating further complications for both Japan and himself. However, when Zorzal's sweepers arrive and seize Sherry, he changes his mind, demands her release, asserting that she is his fiance and his responsibility. That's good enough for the Imperial Knight nearby, and he forcibly encourages the reluctant goon to release Sherry, who rushes into Sugawada's embrace. The Rose Knights defend the palace and protect the Japanese diplomats from a charge of Zorzal's men. Meanwhile, the Japanese government engages in a debate, considering whether to evacuate Jade Palace and withdraw their citizens, or leave the security to the Rose Knights. For the moment, they choose not to risk exposing just how unstable things are in the special region, while foreign dignitaries and media are at allness. Amidst the chaos, Sugawara and Sherry remain present, feeling responsible for the conflict. They are relieved when Marquis Castle emerges, proclaiming the Empire has assigned him as Sherry's guardian. Meanwhile, at Allness, Noriko chats with Komurazaki, a Japanese journalist. She's working as a liaison with all of the newly arrived media personnel. Komurazaki is a conspiracy-minded sensationalist reporter, determined to uncover any incriminating information that could tarnish the government's reputation and expose its concealed secrets. He doesn't trust Noriko's perspective of the situation, since it was the JSDF who rescued her. She welcomes the interruption of being called away from him to address another matter. Itami and company head back to Rondel to carry on with Lele's thesis presentation. They decided it doesn't matter where they are. They'll constantly be looking over their shoulders for assassins anyways, so they might as well be there and be productive about it. Their first night back at the hotel, they anticipate an attack, and rightfully so. This time, their would-be assassins are the hotel staff. The poor guys were manipulated, under the influence of some kind of mind control magic. This smacks of the work of one called The Piper, who never actually does the deed himself, but puppets weaker-minded individuals into doing his bidding. Little is known about The Piper, and since Shandy is a new face in town, not known to be part of Itami's team, she's tasked with investigating. They hear that only now word is spreading through Rondel about the group's slaying of the dragon. This gets them thinking about the delay of communication across the Empire. Itami's worried about what news they could be missing, and focuses on trying to get in contact with the JSDF. Back at the Imperial capital, Zorzal's none too pleased about the failure of his sweepers at Jade Palace. His man assures him that responsibility has been taken, and that he plans to mobilize their new army immediately. Pina takes a bath, and gets an update on the state of things at Jade Palace. She must go there at once. But then Zorzal's generals barge in to summon her to a meeting with Zorzal, and take advantage of the moment to get a good look. Imperial soldiers arrive at Jade Palace. The Rose Knights are dismayed. Instead of fighting Zorzal's hand-picked loyalists, these are their fellow countrymen, and there are a thousand of them. Zorzal refuses to allow Pina to leave the palace, effectively imprisoning his sister. Debate about rescuing delegates and diplomats pops up again in the Japanese government. Finally, a rescue operation is given a green light. In the capital, the Rose Knights swear to uphold the honor of what they know their country stands for, despite what it's becoming under Zorzal's rule and regardless of who they have to face. Meanwhile, Shandy stakes out the hotel staff, and they're approached by a mysterious woman. She's also manipulating them, pretending to want to put an end to the Piper herself and it's easy to get them on board. She's the only lead Shandy's got, and she tails her. After not hearing a word from her for four days, Shandy suddenly bursts through the door to find Itami and the girls preparing for Lele's thesis defense. She fills them in on what she's been able to find out, which isn't much, but at least now the team has confirmation of the Piper's appearance. They arrive at the hall and are joined by Lele's sister and Mimosa, Itami divulges his suspicions about the Piper enlisting one of the candidates. And sure enough, an old man brandishes a knife, but Itami is quick to catch the would-be assassin. The ceremony gets underway, 
and the first presentation isn't going over well. It's unclear whether his information is no good or his presentation of it, but he's humiliated out of the ceremony. The next presentation is successful, but only just. It seems like whoever reacts first, good or bad, seems to get the rest of the room to follow them. Lele is up, but before she can get started, Nola, the woman who met with the hotel staff, leaps over the crowd toward the stage, knife in hand. It's too quick for Itami to react, but the rest of the room was waiting for this. It seems Nola never learned not to bring a knife to a magic fight. Just as the crew moves on, leaving Lele to it, Shandy approaches Lele with yet another knife. Unfortunately, the third time's the charm. The Rose Knights are holding their own at Jade Palace, but the going isn't easy and they're running low on supplies. Elsewhere, Tule continues her Machiavellian schemes, manipulating Zorzal into driving the Empire down a path of self-destruction. She revels in the triumph of Pina's imprisonment, in the very cell she once occupied. In Rondel, Itami and the others find Lele unharmed, courtesy of her protective armor. Shandy reveals her intention to present Lele's severed head to Zorzal to prove Pina's loyalty and secure her survival. Professing her unwavering love for Pina, it's clear to the rest of them that this is what the Piper took advantage of. Amid their discussion, a messenger arrives, delivering the news of Pina's imprisonment. JSDF forces in the special region are given the green light for a rescue operation and begin to mobilize. Itami and company pile into the Humvee and race toward the capital, listening in on the mobilization efforts over the radio. Early the next morning, the JSDF's air force launches their offensive. Small teams of ground forces secure strategic locations, and paratroopers are deployed over the capital. Witnessing the might of the JSDF, Zorzal is in a state of confusion and panic. He attempts to issue orders to his generals, but his commands are erratic and ineffectual. Tuol manipulates his ego into defending his empire at all costs. Kurukawa and others facilitate the evacuation of pro-peace residents to Italica. Meanwhile, Itami is tearing across the landscape like a rallycross driver. At Jade Palace, tensions mount as the Rose Knights and Zorzal's forces confront each other, poised for yet another battle. But before the clash ensues, JSDF Airborne 11th launches a surprise attack from the bushes. Afterwards, the JSDF aid in the evacuation of wounded Rose Knights and Japanese diplomats, airlifting them back to safety in Allness. Boses, in a fit of blind loyalty, rides off to rescue Princess Pina. Beefida follows, sensibly aware that it's not going to work like this. They arrive at a gate that's been fortified by Zorzal's soldiers, who no longer recognize the Rose Knights as comrades and consider Princess Pina a traitor. The two are refused entry, attacked, and pursued by the Imperial Cavalry. They lead their pursuers toward the remaining troop of Japanese soldiers, who are poised to return to Alnus having completed their mission. They provide cover for the Rose Knights and take them aboard the last helicopter. Boses cries out for Pina. Her rescue was not part of the mission, and the JSDF can do nothing. News of the successful evacuation reaches Zorzal, leaving him seething with anger and frustration. Tool suggests they take control of the narrative of what just went down. It was the Imperial Army that sent the JSDF running away. This won't be the last engagement with Japanese soldiers, after all, and they have to maintain the Empire's morale. The third recon is reunited and Itami gets to work organizing an unsanctioned rescue mission. His next genius strategy is pretty much just a discount Trojan horse. Unsurprisingly, nobody suspects a thing, and it works like a charm. Meanwhile, Zorzal subjects Pina to a trial in front of doubtful soldiers. She's accused of treason, and he declares his intent to use her, as well as the prospect of peace talks, to lure the JSDF into an ambush once they've regrouped. The third recon splits into two teams, one focused on rescuing Pina and the other focused on rescuing the Emperor, who's unconscious but alive. Successfully infiltrating the palace, they reach their respective targets. Itami and his team storm the throne room, catching Zorzal and his guards off guard. Zorzal panics, like he does. His guards are unwilling to take up arms against the legendary Rory Mercury, so Zorzal unleashes an ogre on them. Lele and Rory take it down, barely breaking a sweat. When Zorzal challenges Itami to a one-on-one -on -one duel, 
Itami refuses and lets him know they will always have him in their sights, and a sniper fires a warning shot just to drive the point home. He retrieves Pina and the team make their escape. Barreling through the city and through little barricades of Zorzal's men, they scoop up the rest of the team as well as the Emperor. Some pursuing cavalry are easily handled by some strategically placed explosives. Pina expresses her gratitude to Itami and his team for rescuing her and her father, assuming that he was their primary objective and she just got lucky. Itami clarifies that his mission was to save her. It was his higher-ups who were like, hey, while you're in there, why don't you do the thing with the guy too? The Emperor regains consciousness and instantly declares that Pina is now rightful heir to the throne. He expresses his trust in her to guide the future of the Empire. Meanwhile, Zorzal and his loyalist entourage leave the capital and head to the northeast of the Empire. Hitoshi, who had been undercover as one of his cooks, tails him and reports on his movements, and fires a shot every now and then just to freak him out. Ten days later, Pina is crowned as the Princess Regent of the Empire in a grand ceremony. She pledges to restore peace to the land, expressing hope for peaceful coexistence in the special region. Itami, however, is absent from the ceremony. It turns out that the inner otaku always wins. He's back in Japan, eagerly awaiting entry to the manga convention that he didn't get a chance to attend the day of the Empire's emergence from the gate. Unfortunately, he doesn't even get his foot in the door before Rory, Tuka, and Lele intercept him and ruin his plans. Thank you for sticking until the end. Subscribe for more videos like this.